The Unshackled Waves, Episode 66. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, back for this week's review episode, and I'm joined once again by my co-editor-in-chief of The Unshackled, Suka Fernando. Welcome again. Thanks, Tim. And by the way, happy Heterosexual Friday. Yes, it is. It's June 29th today, which uh, this time last year, uh, Heterosexual Pride Day uh, trended on Twitter. So The Unshackled is celebrating the anniversary of it today because there's heaps of LGBT themed days. So we, uh, we thought, why, why can't straight people have their own day? Yeah, I think if anyone deserves something, then it's straight people who continue the human race. <laughs> yeah. Although, obviously, there'll be quite a few people uh, triggered by it. Yeah, there will be. (laughs) Now, on last week's show, the focus was on international developments. We hardly touched uh, Australia at all, but this week, Australian politics has exploded. Uh, It started with the, uh, as they're called, the the Pine Tapes were released by Andrew Bolt. This is where, at a gathering or uh, what he thought was an off-the-record gathering with uh, some left-wing members of the Liberal Party. Uh, Christopher Pine, who is uh, manager of government business in the House and also the Minister for Defence Industry, boasted that the Liberal left faction uh, was was now in charge and that he'd always been a supporter of Malcolm Turnbull. And he also said that we're going to be receiving marriage equality. That's uh, his words, not mine. We refer to it as same-sex marriage. Uh, was going to be happening uh, very soon. Uh, so following that, uh, Tony Abbott and his supporters have responded with a week of criticism of the leftward dr- drift of the government. Tony Abbott accused Christopher Pine of uh, disloyalty and uh, also said that the government should keep its uh, commitment to hold a plebiscite on same-sex marriage, which Turnbull has been very quick to reaffirm. Tony Abbott has given two public addresses this week, one to the Institute of Public Affairs, one for the Centre of Independent Studies outlining an alternative uh, vision for the government. Now, the the media has gone into overdrive with leadership speculation and the conflict between uh, Turnbull and Abbott. So it looks like we're seeing the the Rudd-Gillard years all over again. And it's also worth pointing out that while the Liberal Party is descending into into this infighting, uh, Cory Bernardi's party continues to grow as he just gained a a new state uh, MLC, raising the the number of uh, elected MPs in the party to four. Also this week, AFL again crossed over with politics. How often have we seen this? This was thanks to Richmond player Basha Hooli, uh, who is the game's most prominent Muslim player. Uh, at the beginning of the week, he had Malcolm Turnbull give uh, $625,000 of taxpayers' money to his uh, Basha Hooli Cup, which is to help Muslims play AFL, which I don't see why they need uh, help to play AFL more than anyone else. What else? Uh, but what made matters worse is that uh, Basha Hooley, he uh, knocked, uh, knocked a Carlton player, Jed Lamb, unconscious uh, uh, on the weekend. And most people expected that the AFL Board Tribunal would give him four weeks, but uh, he presented character uh, evidence from Malcolm Turnbull and also uh, Waleed Ali, uh, which got his uh, striking charge reduced to two weeks. Now, even though this is only an AFL tribunal decision, uh, it still sends the message that uh, Muslims and people from designated victims groups uh, are treated differently when it comes to matters such as this. And there's already talk from uh, rightly annoyed AFL fans that he will be booed on his uh, return to playing, which, of course, will just open up uh, another huge uh, scandal. But but we'll start with... uh, the drama inside the Liberal Party, which uh, which features both Pine, Turnbull and Abbott. Now, Pine, it was, it's fair to say it was a very triumphant speech. He thought that he was speaking to a room of what well, he calls the moderates, but they're, they're lefties in the Liberal Party saying, you know, we, we ruled the roost. And it was pretty much when 
Pine's mask was ripped off. Uh, when he was uh, Tony Abbott's uh, manager of government business, he, he pretended to be a uh, conservative, but a as we saw in that tape, he's like, you know, I'm a, a left-wing liberal and I'm proud of it and, you know, we're going to do all these things for you. Yeah, I think it's just the latest example of how the Liberal Party is moving towards the left and how it's drifting um, towards a particular section of ideologies that have nothing to do with its foundation, with its values, and have nothing to do with its supporters either. Um, and, you know, the thing is, it just, it just goes to show that the liberal left faction, um, which is headed by a sort of exclusive club called the Black Hand, it just goes to show that um, they actually wield significant power over the party. Um, and that's dangerous for not just for, for that party, but for the entire country, because it shows that um, they're trying to sort of um, mold um, both Labour and Liberal together and sort of make it a personality politics thing rather than make it um, something based on policy and um, ideology. Yeah, it's, well, in New South Wales, at least, the, the, the left has got a firm grip on the, the party now. I mean, there, there's even talk that they want to uh, roll Tony Abbott during the, the next pre-selection for his seat, which would, that would really, you know, send the message that conservatives are not welcome. Well, the, the right faction of the Liberal Party, they hit back by uh, describing the recent passing of Gonski 2.0 as left-wing lunacy, which, of course, giving more money to schools unconditionally. I mean, <laughs> that's pretty much the definition of uh, left wing. And so uh, basically, ever since these tapes were released by Andrew Bolt, some, somebody there obviously uh, gave them to, to Bolt and Pine uh, th thought that this would just stay off the record, but it's really blown up the, the tension in the Liberal Party. And as I mentioned in my introduction, Abbott's put forward his alternative uh, vision with his two public addresses and he's also been on on radio as well he's been on I think 2GB twice this week once with Ray Hadley to uh, criticize Christopher Pine and once yesterday saying you know as a backbencher I'm entitled to you know, my opinion and, and offer alternative views about the direction of the party. Yeah, I think the thing is, people have criticised Tony since recently for being too critical. But I think this time his criticisms are justified. I think I think they're proportionate, and I think they're justified because, um, you know, the problem right here is that Christopher Pine is, you know, without any regret, without any shame, he's saying explicitly that, you know, he wants to take the party further to the left, um, and Tony is right, rightly criticising him and the party um, for losing their path, for losing their direction, um, simply because they they have been infiltrated by the left and by his left-wing faction. Um, so I think, um, you know, saying that you, you, you're going to allow marriage equality or safest marriage, um, it's, it's, again, it's just quite a betrayal, really, um, for us, because, you know, you they promised to give us um, a plebiscite. That was the promise to the election. And Pine is saying that, you know, we will somehow make sure marriage equality or same-sex marriage um, is passed, you know, that legislation is given. That doesn't make sense. That, that's not how it's meant to go, because they are meant to give people um, a democratic opportunity to, to have a say in this issue. And Tony is, you know, I, I understand that previously, in pre previously it may he may have gone too far in criticizing the liberals and criticizing Marcus Turnbull, but this time, I think it's proportionate and I think he's doing everything right. Uh, well, Pine didn't actually say how they were going to get uh you know, marriage equality. We've always got to use those brackets yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, so he, he, did, he didn't say that they were going to force a parliamentary vote, which would be a total clear broken promise. Uh, they still have the option of doing the postal plebiscite since they couldn't get the uh, proper plebiscite through the parliament. I still think that sh uh, would be a, a viable option. But there was also a story early in the week that uh, that there was, they were going to try a sneaky way to get same-sex marriage through uh, Liberal backbenchers Trent Zimmerman and Senator Dean Smith, who uh, I should point out are both gay, so they've clearly you know, got, got an interest in this. We're going to sponsor a private member's bill, and although frontbenchers would be bound to vote against it, uh, the aim would be there'd be enough backbench, Liberal backbenchers crossing the floor, so it would just happen that way, which is a very sneaky way and of... Uh, uh, I, ca I can't believe that they actually had the audacity to, to pull that one off. 
Yeah, I, mean, I think um, they're trying to, as I said earlier, they're trying to control the party and they want, want to actually um, sort of do what they want they want to do um, and ignore all the election promises. Um, again, that's that's a huge problem. And I think, I think you know, as you mentioned earlier, you know, the fact that Christopher Pine was once a conservative or called himself a conservative and now he's openly, um, well, not openly, I guess, but, you know, he's unashamedly in that particular environment. He's, you know, saying this and you know, he's saying that we will have magic quality. Um, he will try and get 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 something done about it. Um, again, just kind of shows what's happening with the liberals and it's dangerous to the party because if we have another, um, another leadership spill, that that's going to be another problem. And we have seen, we've already seen people like um, Cory Bernardi leaving the party because of these shenanigans. Um, so if we continue to have, have these dysfunctions, um, these divisions within the party, then it's going to be a huge problem for the entire government. Uh, and I, I've said this before, I don't think Tony Abbott deserves to come back, which I know is uh, very, a very unpopular view to have in conservative circles. But I've always on, been of the opinion that although he's saying some good things now, how come he didn't behave like this when he was prime minister? I mean, he put forward some very uh, left, left-wing ideas where, when he was prime minister. I mean, he was pushing the constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. He abandoned reform on uh, 18C. Uh, there was the, the, sa- the Safe Schools program that was initially rolled out while he was uh, pr- uh, prime minister. And he renegotiated the uh, renewable energy target to its current rate. I think it's around 23%. So he d- did all these have what would be defined as lefty things when he was prime minister, but now that he's on the back bench where it's easier to speak your mind, he's saying all these conservative things. So I just don't, I think he's he's being a political opportunist uh, because of, well, I'm not sure if he thinks he can be prime minister again. He probably realises he can't. But I, I think he's, he's definitely wanting to be the standard bearer for conservative values because that's where he thinks he's most likely to get the most lauded. But it's also because he wants, you know, revenge on for, for what happened to him, uh, being cut down after only being in, in the job for, for two years. So I, I just don't think that Abbott's genuine in what he's pushing now. I think he's just motivated by, as I said, political opportunism. Yeah, it does look like um, he is because, um, you know, uh, yeah, it makes sense because he was prime minister for a while. He could have done more things. He could have avoided doing some of those things he listed. However, I do think I would rather have Tony Abbott um, as prime minister. I think um, if he, if there is going to be a leadership spill and Tony Abbott is one of the candidates, I would support him. Um, and in regards to some of those issues you mentioned before, I think the thing is um, some of those issues I wouldn't say are very you know, sort of important. Uh, I understand the renewable energy thing, um, you know, the Aboriginal recognition. I don't think they are as important as things like marriage or, you know, the the other social issues. Um, I know that safe schools is a huge problem, but the thing is back then, no one knew what safe schools was about. People were oblivious. Uh, Well, people people weren't told what it was. I mean, people found out much later on what Save Schools is about after reading the thing, after, you know, seeing all the videos of... And I should um, also point out, guess who the education minister was at the time? It was Simon... It wasn't Simon Birmingham. Christopher Pine. (laughs) Yeah, no, you're... Yeah, he was, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he was education and then he was um, the defence and then he became the defence industry, didn't he? He, he, he went from education, industry, and now defense industry. Right, okay, yeah. Well, that's interesting. That's, again, that says something, okay. Um, however, again, I will reiterate that, firstly, back then, no one knew what safe schools really was. I mean, those videos weren't there. Um, those videos came up early, came up much later, the media scrutiny. Um, all that came up much later, and at first we thought that it was a genuine anti-bullying program and we thought it was a nice thing to do you know okay you know what you know it's a nice thing to help people um and you know if it, if it means anti-bullying that's great okay but the thing is we later on found out what it was so i think i think it's understandable why he did support it at first however if he knew what it was and if he knew what the entire program was about that's a huge problem and if he knew um what it what it actually entailed then i think i i obviously I obviously condemn that because he should have done something, um, unless of course he was powerless and people were controlling him. In which case, that's a different scenario. Um, but however, in overall, I think those other issues aren't as huge in comparison to things like marriage and 
these these social issues that we are facing right now. And even though, like, obviously Turnbull's, you know, a lefty deep down, but conservatives yeah. have got a lot out of out of him. I mean, yeah. the, uh, Turnbull was very quick to say that, you know, we're sticking with the, going to be sticking with the plebiscite on same-sex marriage. I mean, he's proposed the citizenship changes, which is a lot more than what Tony Abbott did when mm. he was Prime Minister. Turnbull yeah. actually put a bill to uh, replace 18C, uh, which Abbott, his uh, proposed changes didn't even uh, make it to the the floor of the parliament. So, uh, and he's also talked Turnbull as well talked about you know needing more coal fired power and energy security. So yeah, I, I know that Turnbull's a lefty, and you know obviously it was on full display this week with his giving money to Basha Hooley. Uh, but yeah, conservatives have got a lot out of uh, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, and sort of I think it, uh, that that's a good thing that even though he's obviously not one of us, if we can get what we want out of him, that's good. And so I just, yeah, and with coupled with that, the fact that, you know, Abbott's just being a political opportunist, I don't, don't, I don't see the benefit of going back to Abbott. And plus, even if Turnbull is to fall over, I'd much rather the prime ministership go to somebody who's been a consistent conservative, such as Peter Dutton, who's been excellent in immigration, cracking down on uh, fake refugees, uh, and also taking on the culture wars. You know, you criticised Alan Joyce, uh, Yasmin Abdul-Magid and, and Fairfax. He really goes in hard, and he's doing that while he's a cabinet minister uh, in, in, in the Turnbull government. So I would rather... I, I would feel much more confident that the the right thing is going to be done by conservatives with somebody like Dutton in charge rather than Abbott, because who knows, Abbott might just revert back to being what he was the first time around. Oh, definitely. I think you know. I think Abbott is a, is better than Malcolm Turnbull. I think, although I think you know, there are other conservatives who probably are much better than Abbott, um, and who have displayed more integrity, um, who who have displayed more consistency over their views, um, and those people would probably be better. Um, you know, I I do think um, Malcolm Turnbull has been very sort of, um, as you mentioned with the Bashar Hawley, has been very um, lenient on the Islamic community. Tony Abbott, however, was a bit more critical, I would say, because he, did, um, he didn't he did hesitate to sort of um, explicitly state what ISIS wanted, for example. Um, but, you know, these days, Malcolm Turnbull isn't like that. He doesn't want to explicitly sort of um, blame ISIS or sort of go into that um, because he's uh, I'm pretty sure he's afraid that it might offend Muslims and therefore it'll encourage them to be terrorists um, but Tony Abbott was different he was sort of to the point with ISIS we will bomb them they want to you know I, I remember him saying that they want to stab our kidneys as a quote um, and we want, we'll bomb them we will do something do something about it so I think in that sense he was better but ultimately yeah I think um, despite being better than Turnbull he probably wouldn't be as good as other conservatives in the party and, and it's also worth pointing out that Abbott, you know, th uh, throughout this week, you know, speaking out against the government, he is actually helping Bill Shorten become Prime Minister because of the way yeah. the public sees it is that there's disunity in the, the Liberal Party. I don't want them running the country. And even though they don't particularly like Bill Shorten, I mean, there's no internal problems within the, the Labor Party at the moment. So basically, Abbott is basically just being a wrecker because of business. And I don't want a Bill Shorten prime ministership because that will mean, uh, you know, same sex marriage will probably become law, safe schools will come back, uh, the borders will be open, there'll be appeasement uh, of Islam, uh, there'll be, you know, more uh, action on climate change, it'll be a disaster. And I don't think that's beneficial. Yes, Turnbull and the Liberals have their flaws, but I don't think Australia could survive under a shortened Labor government, especially how left-wing the Labor Party is these days. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, uh, Tony, I think Tony does need to sort of, as I said earlier on, um, you know, I think earlier on at first when he, he was criticising Malcolm Turnbull all the time, um, I think that was too far um, and that did display some sort of disunity. Um, however, right now I think it is justified and it's proportionate because, you know, um, this is a huge a huge important issue you know it's 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 very concerning the fact that the, the labor the liberal left um within the party is actually trying to get control so i think in that sense his criticisms are proportioned however um we did see recently um well not recently we, we saw two days ago um him um making up his own platform you know um, sort of emphasizing places 
placing emphasis on his own plans for the country and having his own policies. Um, in that sense, that probably would have been too far because now it looks like you know two parties within one party, and that does um, ex well, that does sort of um, magnify upon those divisions, and that may have an impact on their future electoral results. And uh, let's talk about like Abbott versus Turnbull in re realistic terms. I mean, Abbott hardly has any support in the party room these days. I mean, there was Sky News's Kieran Gilbert today who said that uh, all uh, Abbott supporters in the party room they could all fit in a Toyota Camry. It's, it's that small. So uh, yeah, there, there's definitely not the groundswell for, for Tony Abbott to come back. And a lot of the people that backed him in the initial leadership ballot, such as Matthias Cormann, uh, Peter Dutton, uh, Christian Porter, Josh Frydenberg, Conchetta Ferravanti Wells, are all firmly behind Turnbull now and have criticised uh, Abbott. Uh, but, but there's also uh, I, I've, a lot of people like do, do get that this uh, action by Abbott is is leading to instability and damaging the Liberals' chances at the next election. I think it's all but certain now we'll have a shortened prime ministership, uh, given, given how the Liberals are currently going. But there's a lot of people who think that the Liberals need to lose to learn the lesson of, of what they did to Abbott, that cutting him down after two years and replacing him with a leftist uh, a person from the left of the Liberal Party was the wrong thing to do and so they need a term to sit out in opposition so they learn their lesson and then come back with a real conservative leader for the next following election. Yeah, I think, you know, sometimes you do have to sort of um, lose in order to actually learn a lesson. And, um, you know, maybe that's the best way for the Liberal Party to fix itself. Um, but as you mentioned earlier, if that does happen, it's going to be very bad for us. You know, if Labour dominates and passes all these laws, um, you know, legalises marriage equality or same marriage, whatever, um, you know, that's going to be bad for us. So. I'm I'm hoping that if they're you know if if lib the liberals do lose, I'm hoping that a minor party might actually get more votes, and maybe we have the ability to actually block Labour's um plan. So if if Labour does win most seats, but then a minor party also has lots of seats, I'm I'm hoping um you know they they are able to do something about um you know Labour's plan. So that would be a good scenario, I would say, in many ways. Um, but you know let let let's see what let's see it's it quite early to um, sort of speculate on that. So let's see what happens with that. The reason why I'm, why I'm so against this strategy of the, the Liberals need to lose is because, yes, we have three years of Labor. And I remember uh, back in the 2014 Victorian state election, people are saying that the state Liberals, they deserve to lose because they stood for nothing. I was like, yeah, but we'll have four years of Daniel Andrews. Like, Victoria yeah. won't be able to uh, survive that. But, uh, but they said, no, you know, we've got to teach the Liberals a lesson. But look, it's what's happening to Victoria uh, yeah. uh, two and a half years into Daniel Andrews' premiership, I mean, we're the crime capital uh, of Australia, and just look at all the uh, destructive things he's, he's doing. Yeah, that, exactly, exactly right. You know, it, it, it may be a good way for the party to fix itself, but if it if that does happen, it's we, it's the people who suffer, um, because we will see more cultural Marxism, we will see more regressivism, we will see, you know, more crime, more migration, um, and so... It's going to be bad for us, you know. So that, therefore, that's why I'm, I'm hoping, you know, maybe that doesn't turn out like that. Hopefully, the liberals have already learned their lesson, um, and if they have, maybe they are fixing themselves now. If they're not, that's a problem. Um, and if they do want to fix themselves, then they need to look at the liberal left faction and look at the black hand because um, that is the force that is resulting in their downfall. It's resulting in people turning away from them. And just like in Victoria, people in, in the entire country may have the mindset, you know, the Liberals need to vote, the Liberals, the liberals turn it over, um, we must give Labour a chance and make Liberals fix themselves. Um, and that will result in something worse for us. So, you know, um, if they do want to fix themselves, they must um, choose to focus on a liberal left faction and that way they can actually try and get back, you know, sort of re- uh, you know, sort of um, re-establish that link between them and their true conservative supporters who probably form the majority of this country. Yeah. Now, let's talk about some well, real conservatives now, which is the Australian Conservatives uh, political party founded by Cory Bernardi. He pulled off a, another coup this week. He recruited 
uh, Rachel Carleen Jenkins from the Democratic Labor Party, who's an MLC in Victoria, which now there's uh, Corey in Canberra, there's the two former Family First uh, MLCs in South Australia who are now members of Australian Conservatives. So he's got a reasonable team behind him now. We also learnt that the party has now more than 10,000 members. And remember, the party was only founded in February this year. That's quite an amazing uh, feat. And he's managed to, to do... Uh, Cory Bernardi in this short time what so many others before him have failed to do which is unite the the right and the desperate socially conservative parties under one banner and I think certainly Australian Conservatives is flying under the radar I mean uh, Cory Bernardi is he's, he's running a very smooth political operation and I think they'll be the dark horse next election. Yeah, again, I think this is a result of, you know, what we have seen in, in the Lib within the Liberals. You know, this is what, what happens when the traditional centre-right party moves away from their true values um, and people look for other parties. And Cory Bonatti has given us the opportunity um, to look for another different ray of hope um, because, you know, he is able to actually continue on with what the Liberals should stand for. Um, and that can actually, you know, get them more support um, from the cons from conservative people in Australia. So it's a result of what's happening in the Liberals and Cory Bernardi is able to appeal to us and hopefully he can um, and he will get more members, get more, get other parties w within his umbrella. And then that will be that'll make it much better for us because that will give us a new, um, a better party to vote for. And I think Cory Bernardi does feel vindicated by his decision to leave the Liberal Party uh, back uh, back in February, especially since all that's going on in the Liberal Party. And the reason why I think that Australian Conservatives is such a, an attractive option for people who are disenfranchised with the Liberal Party is because Cory Bernardi all throughout his career has been a conviction politician and he's also he's not afraid to uh, take on the the more controversial issues. I mean, uh, he wants to address you know what's happening with uh, Islam. He obviously wants to put forward a proper uh, so socially conservative agenda. So uh, uh, definitely, if you're if you're fed up with you know all the factions in the Liberal Party, uh, politicians constantly letting you down, then Australian Conservatives is is the superior option. Um, yeah, I think Cory Bernardo has been. Um... Well, he's been unshackled from political correctness by leaving the Liberal Party because political correctness has now taken over the party. And as we have seen um, for the past several months, we have seen how the Liberal Party is moving with the tide of the new left-wing movement, with the new left-wing um, sort of crowd and trying to be politically correct. Um, but Cory Bernard has, has been able to not do that and actually speak the truth and appeal to people by saying things the way, that, the way they are, by saying that, you know, that safe school is a problem, by saying that victimization is a problem. Um, so I think that um, that has allowed people to actually see the light and has allowed people to well to, to realize that there is a better alternative and this growth we have seen with the Australian Conservatives is just a sign of that um, you know same thing with One Nation in in, 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 in the same way because um, you know One Nation was there they, they weren't politically correct and they they are able to receive the support of people because they are able to say things the way they are now there is a difference between One Nation Conservatives obviously there is um, but you know they both are able to appeal to the people and sort of tell them the truth and make it look like they, they do know the truth. Uh, and Cory Bernardi has said that possibly more uh, mergers with other smaller conservative parties are on the cards. I mean, he's talking to uh, Australian Christians, and let's not forget he's already had uh, Kira Lee Smith, who was probably the most prominent member of the Australian Liberty Alliance, uh, join his party. And in my article that I wrote, the socially conservative minor party vote was around 4.71% at the last federal election for the Senate. So if Cory Bernardi is able to get most of that, and uh, some of the disaffected uh, Liberal Party voters as well, then he's got a pretty solid vote base and, and could get uh, a lot of, a few senators elected and quite a few people elected in state upper houses as well. Yeah, because, you know, he's able to, you know, as I said earlier, you know, he's able to sort of, um, you know, uh, it, um, sort of reveal the truth when it comes to particular issues. Um, and that's, 
I think that's been the key to his success. You know, he's able to unite the right um, and sort of, you know, provide provide people with this um, sort of new alternative um, by merging with other social conservative parties. You know, Family First is you know, meant to be one of the other parties that if they existed, it may have actually inhibited um, the conservatives from getting the from getting more votes because people would have been um, forced to choose between Family First and AC. But now, since AC and Family First have merged, people are able to um, sort of choo choose them because you know they're not you know they're not in some sort of um, path where there are two two ways to choose from. You know, they're able to choose um, the party that you know two parties rather that that can you know give them what they want in regards to future social policy and you have to remember that the reason why uniting the right and the conservative parties is so important is because the senate voting changes now which mean that uh it's much harder for uh micro parties to get elected because they can't directly preference each other now uh so corbyn over bringing these groups together he's getting a solid we will get a solid uh, primary vote, which we hope will get him over the line in uh, in getting a full Senate quota. Yeah, I think um, something that might, might actually prevent that from happening, you know, is the competition right now, because people have said that, you know, um, sort of creating new parties might result in a divided right, not a united right. In some ways, that is correct, because, you know, if AC and One Nation are both present, then they might have to compete with each other. And that, that means that they wouldn't have actually gotten the votes they would have gotten if they were one party. So people are saying that, you know, maybe One Nation and AC should um, actually merge and create this one big party. And so it'll make it much easier for them to tackle the liberals, tackle the left. Um, and that does sound like a good idea because thing is competition while a good thing in this scenario, competition is a bad thing because more competition means people have to choose, you know, from all these alternatives. But it'll be much easier for them to choose um, between much, you know, less alternatives. Um, so if one nation has emerged, then they wouldn't be sort of um, eating away from each other as they would if they were competing. Um, and then, you know, that'll make it much easier to sort of t take over and maybe have a, a, a larger chunk of the vote. Uh, I think the reason why that's pro uh, probably uh, as not a bigger concern is because One Nation, it's only really strong in, in Queensland and to a degree Western Australia. It doesn't have appeal in the, the other states. And also it's the fact that One Nation, even though Pauline Hanson, she's done a lot of good over the years, she's not good at running a party machine, a professional political operation, because we've seen the, the troubles that One Nation had, has had. And so I definitely feel that Australian Conservatives, if One Nation is to fall by the wayside, will will still be there with a proper apparatus there. I mean, Corey Bernard has been in a, a party machine for 30 years. He knows how to run these things. I think it's uh, still important for Australian Conservatives to be there just as a as a strong alternative free of the the fraction that's always come along with uh, one nation yeah yeah no you're right yeah I mean if they do if they do merge together then that'll actually make this party factionalized as well because they they do have lots of points where they differentiate um you know one nation is meant to be more protectionist AC ultimately is still meant to be more about free trade, um, but you know they they, are, they just want to scrutinize free trade and they just want to make sure people understand what free trade is. They're not really against free trade. One nation is different. They are they are against free trade. Um, so I think if they do merge, then you know it might actually create a a big party. But then if if it does, then it'll still have factions and that'll that that'll inhibit their growth. Um, so it is complicated. Yeah. Um, but you know I, I think. It will be much better if they do focus on different areas. As I said, One Nation is more of a Queenslander, um, West Australia, and New South Wales in many ways. Um, but AC would be a different a different story. Um, so it will be it will be much better if they do focus on different regions, um, and that way they wouldn't be um, you know sort of distracting themselves with you know areas that you know that wouldn't help them. For example. AC shouldn't be running shouldn't be running in northern Queensland and one nation probably shouldn't be running in in Wentworth in, in Sydney you know so you know it's, it's going to be that, that's going to be a bit of a complicated scenario but I hope they can coordinate with, with each other to make sure they do get the potential that they are able to get. Well, at least that's a positive. While you know the Liberal Party is in disarray, at least there are viable alternatives popping up for people on the right to to vote with. But we should move on to our final topic yeah. now, which is of course Australia's newest uh, regressive, uh, Basha Hawley. 
So, so far in his career, he's been uh, another perpetuator of identity politics. So, uh, he, I should say he plays for uh, Richmond in the AFL. He has the Bashahooli Cup, which is a a cup for high school uh, students at Muslim schools in Western Sydney. And he's also got the Bashahula Academy as well to uh, train uh, young Muslims to be community leaders. So, you know, he's, he's obviously big on, you know, wanting, you know, more Muslims to play AFL. I don't, don't see why they need a special encouragement to, to play AFL. But Malcolm Turnbull seemed to agree, giving... Uh, $625,000 of taxpayer money to the, uh, the cup on, on Monday. Uh, now, I've, uh, I share this uh, annoyance, and so did many other people, that uh, there's other things that this money could be spent on. Plus, why do Muslims need special money to play AFL? Why not give it to, you know, other uh, groups to encourage them to play AFL? And plus, there's, you know, there's... Uh, people that are struggling in this country isn't it, it, shouldn't the money be yeah. spent, spent on that i think it all stems from this you know this notion this 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 mindset that you know you must appeal to the islamic community to make sure that they don't ra radicalize to make sure that the risk of radicalization among their young people is low and this is the way to do it um that says something firstly about the islamic community that shows that you know if they are offended unlike other religious groups it shows that when muslims are offended they become radicals um in other religions that doesn't, ha that doesn't happen firstly secondly as you mentioned, it's a waste of money. You are, Malcolm Turnbull is practically saying that we must waste money on this instead of doing practical things like, you know, restricting immigration, for example, um, deporting all known radicals or all known um, extremists. No, he, instead what he chose to do is to, you know, spoil them with gifts, um, give them more funding, um, make them feel happy temporarily, even though we know that the extremists will always still be extremists. That doesn't matter. Um, so I think, you know, as you mentioned, there is there is no reason as to why you should give Muslims money to pay AFL when there are people in the streets of Sydney and Melbourne who are, you know, homeless, firstly, and it's just, it, it rem reminds me of how the, the mayor of Sydney, Lord, the Lord Mayor of Sydney, Clover Moore, she spent hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands on an LGBT rainbow style um, uh, road crossing instead of giving that money to the sleep to, to the homeless in Sydney. Um, again, a waste of money based on this unnecessary identity politics um, and it ignores the real issues that we face thanks to the Islamic community. And, and if Turbo uh, wants to know why he's doing so badly in the polls, it's when he does stuff like that that the Australian people yeah, say, yeah. how out of touch can you be? Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, people people can see through this. People know that he's doing this to try and appeal to the Muslims. Um, and they know that this automatically means that, you know, Muslims themselves are, you know, uh, they are susceptible to this radicalization when they're offended. That says something about them. So people are able to see through this. People know what this is about. And ultimately, it just shows that this prime minister is unable to have a practical solution for our problems and instead he focuses on you know showering them with money uh, to try and de-radicalize them which doesn't work it doesn't work but it got worse because uh, it was interesting on the Monday when Turnbull announced this funding, he said what a you know top bloke Bashahooli was, but the previous day when uh, Richmond was playing Carlton, he uh, elbowed uh, the Carlton player Jed Lamb in the face, knocked him out unconscious. Uh, he had to be taken off the field, did not return for the rest of the game, had a concussion, had to have scans. So he was referred straight to the, the AFL tribunal because blows to the head are pretty, uh, pretty serious that the AFL takes them. Uh, and then at his tribunal hearing, he, he first pled not guilty, which if anyone's seen the footage, I mean, it's, it's a pretty ugly incident. Like, intentional, <laughs> e even if it wasn't intentional, it's really reckless. Uh, he yeah. had Malcolm Turnbull and Waleed Ali as character references, you know, saying, you know, what a good community person he was. And the, the AFL tribunal agreed. Most, most AFL commentators thought he'd get at least four weeks and he got two weeks. Or everyone, like, e even though the AFL's very politically correct and so are the commentariat, all of the, all, all of the commentary was unanimous that this was a grossly inadequate uh, ban.
and even the left wing age that said uh, this is not good enough and said that these character yeah. references shouldn't sh- should have stood for nothing. Even Eddie McGuire criticized it. I mean, you know, so you so basically had mo- most most of the AVL community universally said this was uh, not a not a good look, and it basically looked like to the wider community that Bashahuli was abusing his position to get preferential treatment and get a lower penalty. Yeah, I mean, it, just after it happened, we saw all these memes going around on social media, all these comments, all these, you know, posts going around, videos, you know, memes going around on social media saying, um, you know, how Malcolm and Walid, um, you know, saved Bashar from justice. You know, he they, they, they prevented Bashar from deserving what he was meant to have. Um, that makes sense. That's what happened. You know, the fact that even these lefties are criticizing this just shows how, um, you know, how out of touch, you know, how irrational Malcolm Turnbull can be. You know, he's, I mean, okay, I, I, I get he may be trying to, he may, he may have good intentions to try and sort of appeal to these people. Um, but, you know, it doesn't work. You know, time again, we have seen, it doesn't matter if you try and save these people and give them advantages, give them privileges. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, this person was now privileged under under particular rules. Um, it doesn't matter because radicals will always exist. Extremists will always exist. It doesn't matter. Um, so I think, again, ultimately, this will reflect badly on the Liberal Party, ultimately. Ultimately, the Liberal Party is the one who will be hurt by this because now people are going to hate even more. People are going to say, you know, well, this Prime Minister is just completely inadequate. So, you know, if we vote for him again, we'll have him again. Oh, it wasn't that Turnbull actually gave a written character reference for Basha Hawley. Basha Hawley's uh, lawyer just used what Turnbull said the, the previous day as character uh, evidence, but it seemed that uh, Turnbull had no uh, objection to that. But yes, uh, yeah, exactly, most, yeah, most of the yeah. community views this that, yeah, Hawley got special treatment because he's a Muslim and from a designated yeah. uh, victim group. And so they, they didn't want to give, give him uh, as tough a uh, ban as, as he deserved, which basically yeah, communicated to the people that there's one rule for some people and another rule for the rest. Yeah, I mean, this This is a part of this phenomenon we have seen for, for, for a long time, for several months. You know, this is Islamic privilege, okay? Why privilege doesn't exist, okay? What we have right now is minority privilege, and this is Islamic privilege, um, where Muslims, um, again, based on the on this notion that, you know, if you offend them, they'll get, they'll get radicalized, you know, based on that, they are getting special privileges. And this is a perfect example of someone getting special treatment for their religion um, or for their for their racial identity, you know, he's being given privileges because he's Muslim. Doesn't work. It's, you know, again, further est- estranging people from this prime minister. And, you know, I hope, I hope, or I hope he can learn something, but he won't. Well, the AFL is appealing the uh, 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 two-week ban, which is, well, at least they're doing something right, the AFL. Yeah. But there's already talk yeah. on, on social media that uh, Basha Hawley will be booed when he comes back from uh, suspension, yeah. which uh, I basically think that he deserves to be booed because he's basically tried to, yeah. you know, uh, use his privilege to escape a just punishment. <laughs> I mean, this wouldn't have been an issue if he just copped his you know, four week ban, and then we all could have moved on. But because he's tried to weasel out of it, that that's what you know people have really resented, and that's why there there is this you know push to when he plays to to boo him, and it's entirely his fault. And of course, it's also the fault that he has people like Walid and Turnbull, you know, mm. having his back. Yeah. Yeah, again, it just shows how irrational this act was. It just shows how irrational the Prime Minister at first was in trying to, um, you know, uh, shower him with all his gifts, with money. You know, it just shows how irrational Walid Ali was in, you know, standing up for this person who doesn't deserve it. Um, Because now people are going to boo at him, people are going to hate him, and that's going to, you know, result in more Muslims getting offended at this. Um, so, you know, you know, well done, Prime Minister, you know, now more Muslims will get offended, and now, you know, there'll be more terrorist attacks. So, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, there, yeah, well, yeah, there will be more terrorist attacks, but there will be more radicalization, there will be people who will um, get offended, you know, and, you know, we all know that you, if you get offended, you'll get radicalized, that's the, that's the theme right now. Um, Again, okay, regressive, irrational, and you know, ultimately, does it's not beneficial for anyone. 
yeah, the left will will use the booing of Bashahuli to say, oh, it's proof that Australians are yeah. Islamophobic yeah. And, and racist. No, it's because, you know, we don't exactly, like yeah. people yeah. playing identity politics. I mean, uh, AFL fans, like, they've that that's the reason they booed Adam Goods in the final year of his career, because they were sick of him, yeah. you know, saying Australia was built on racism and genocide. Uh, and so they booed him because, you know, we've had enough of you. Uh, and you know that that is the that will that is the reason why they're booing, not because of you know they're bigots. Yeah, because you know they're booing for a reason, and as you said, the left is going to use this. The left is going to um, you know blow this out of proportion and say, "Oh, look, this is Islamophobia. This booing is not because he hurt a player. It's not because he used his position and his religion for his own advantage. It's because it's Islamophobia." Um, and same with Adam Goods, as you mentioned. You know, it's funny because people are saying it's racism. People are saying you know they're booing because it's they're racist, not be, not because they actually um, you know are angry at him complaining. But there are memes going around. There are people going around saying, you know, we don't boo at Kathy Freeman, do we? No, because Kathy Freeman is grateful. She doesn't go around um, complaining like this. She doesn't go around, you know, flaunting any political um, uh, political stances that she doesn't know much about, um, unlike Adam Goetz, unlike other Aboriginal Aboriginal sports people. Um, so this isn't racism. People aren't booing against Kathy Freeman. People celebrate Kathy Freeman. Um, th there are memes going around saying that, you know, we don't um, boo against her. We don't, you know, criticize her because she doesn't do anything wrong. Um, same thing here, but oh no, people are too oblivious to this fact and people are just going to think that this, this is some sort of white privilege when actually this is Islamic privilege. Well, I suspect this won't be the, the last time we'll discuss Bashahuli and I think he'll certainly be yeah. a nominee for the Unshackled's Regressive of the Year. Definitely. He will definitely be up there. Um, he might even win. Who knows? <laughs> Well, we'll certainly keep an eye on Australian politics in the next few weeks because it's likely now that there'll be more drama, even though the Parliament's in recess. But uh, that's all we've got time for this week. So thank you once again, Sukith, for being my co-host. It was my pleasure. And remember, everyone, to celebrate Heterosexual Pride Day today. Yes. Uh, do something special. Maybe reproduce. Yeah. Exactly. You know, try and restore our birth rate. <laughs> And of course, the usual reminders apply at the end of the show. If you haven't signed up to the email list, please do so at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Uh, please consider supporting the work of The Unshackled. You can be a patron on Patreon. We've arranged some awesome benefits for people who sign up. Please remember that Unshackled merchandise is now on sale at theuprightmarket.com. And also, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. You can do so on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to keep checking the unshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye.